Hi, I'm Melissa, and I've been addiction-free since August 22nd, 2003. Um, I just wanted to share my testimony with you today. Um, it's one of blackouts, uh, drunk driving nonstop, and a lot of sexual shame. And through it all, Jesus Christ's pursuit of me. So I became a Christian when I was eight years old, and that was thanks to this really godly, wonderful woman who lived in my neighborhood. Um, she babysat me, and she brought me to vacation Bible school and to church, and um, brought me to the house of the Lord, thankfully. And it was one summer at that Bible camp that I got down on my knees and accepted Christ as my Savior. So I had that foundation, although um, I didn't really have it in my home. Both of my parents were functional alcoholics and my dad actually started allowing me to drink his, take sips of his beer when I was three years old. Um, my parents just, they weren't around, they were emotionally unavailable. And growing up like that I felt insecure, unworthy, unloved and I just really had a, a deep fear of abandonment. I had terrible anxiety and panic attacks. So I first started getting drunk when I was 15 and I had blackout nearly every time. That was a, a main facet of my drinking was the blackouts uh, and all the time. Alcohol medicated me. It really seemed to help treat my anxiety and panic for the short term anyway. And it made me really out of control, do a lot of irrational things and kind of like this Jekyll Hyde thing where I would really go against my values and morals and um, you know I was promiscuous. I, I had a boyfriend when I was 15 and when he moved away I just started immediately jumping into other relationships and I just call this segment of my life blackouts, bedwetting, and sexual shame. Uh, I was just pretty much on a quest to destroy myself, binging and purging with food. That was another addiction I had gobbling down um, handfuls of amphetamine like pills called ephedrine and just I did that every day for years. I just continued this path I guess you could say kind of like uh, going down a highway to hell for 11 years for the first segment I guess from 15 to 26 I was drinking every chance I could and uh, really no thoughts of stopping. Until I was 26, I had two drunk driving arrests in the span of seven months. I was arrested twice. The second incident was a pretty serious car accident where I rear-ended someone driving in a blackout and she was injured. I had a lot of charges that went along with that incident and um, was fearing I might go to jail. So you could say I was scared straight. I seriously... Uh, you know, I decided to quit drinking, I went to AA, I went to outpatient treatment, I did all those things that we're told to do when we have a problem, and I was placed on electronic home monitoring for my arrest and also on probation. So I, I was sober for 18 months, things were going okay, and you know, life got better of course as it does when we get the chemicals out of, out of um, our lives, but I wasn't sober, truly sober, I wasn't working a spiritual program that's something that's really essential for me I so after you know it was only a matter of time before I drank again so after a year and a half of drill what do you call it <laughs> dry briety I don't know just not drinking but not really doing anything to work on myself or to grow I started drinking again it was inevitable I once again in back in the malt back in the game and drinking driving, relapsing, waking up with strangers, um, just a life of insanity. Is It's it's unstable and it's um, doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. That's what they tell you in AA, which is kind of a trite saying, but I guess it's kind of true. So this was going on. I would was trying to stop. I knew that I needed to quit and that this couldn't continue going on like this indefinitely. And finally, I... Um, well, my father passed away from alcoholic liver failure. As I mentioned, he had been an alcoholic all of his life. He was never able to come out to uh, get himself to a place of recovery. He, I mean, the longest I ever remember him being sober was probably a couple weeks. He did attempt treatment and he attempted to do these things but never really wanted to change, I don't think. 
So he passed away in 2002. He had just turned 54, so he was a very young man. And after seeing somebody die like that and just waste away uh, to alcoholic liver failure is an awful way to die, I really thought that truly would keep me sober forever. And I told myself, I'm never drinking again. Of course, I had said that many times, but I was drunk again in two months. I just couldn't seem to stop. I couldn't seem, you know, I could stop, but I couldn't stay stopped. You know, and every everybody who's had a problem probably will tell you, oh, I don't have, you know, I can stop. It's just that I don't stay away from it. So that continued on after my dad had passed away. I had six more relapses, I would say, about six, because I really was getting worse. Um, on the highway to hell, um, my progression was really steep. Every time I got drunk, there was just a really frightening blackout that would last for hours. Uh, I'd wake up with unexplained bruises and sprains and horrible alcohol withdrawal that I'd, it would take days for me almost, you know, just to get to a place of feeling like I could function. I just felt like I was having a nervous breakdown every time I would drink. It was so bad. Um, and, you know, I, this kept going until finally I came to all of these horrible relapses kind of culminated in one event where the bucket tipped over. The bucket that had been filling for years um, came to this convergence point, I guess you could say. And so on August 21st, 2003, I went to a concert at the Minnesota State Fair. I was living up in Duluth at the time, but drove down to the cities with this guy friend of mine, acquaintance, and... um. I just decided somewhere along the drive down that I was going to drink that night and got it in my head and um, started drinking and that night ended in a 12 hour blackout, interaction with the police, lethal blood alcohol level, a serious fall down the cement stairs at the grandstand, all, all of these things I had no memory of. I mean, my next memory was coming to, I guess you could say, in the morning in this strange motel room with this person that I'd gone to the fair with and just having no recollection of anything beyond maybe 7 p.m. the night before. So that morning I walked through the empty deserted grounds of the state fair looking for my car which had been towed and impounded I later found out so that just put a cap on the whole evening and I was walking along just I wasn't talking to my friend I was just shuffling along just miserable sick starting to get in you know the alcohol withdrawal was starting to come through my body and I was um just just a horrible shame that I can't even describe to you and you know for women who drink like I did they're there's just a great deal of shame usually that accompanies that, in particular sexual shame. Because if you're if you're a blackout drunk and you're a woman, it's pretty standard that you're going to put yourself in situations that you didn't intend, that you you never would have done sober, and that you just horribly regret and um, just makes you feel like very worthless and. Um, I was constantly just fearing that people were going to find out who I really am and what's really going on with me because I was a, a TV news anchor and reporter at that time. I was supposed to be this community representative, but I was going out getting drunk every night in the seediest bars I, I could find, and I constantly felt like people were going to find out and they were going to know what I was really about. I mean drinking in the shower in the morning so I can function and get ready, stealing money out of my daughter's piggy bank so I can go to the bar that night and think it oh I'll put it back when I get paid but then never doing that just the deep deep shame self-hatred unworthiness and more even more than that was the the shame that I felt for abandoning my God my relationship with Jesus so August 22nd 2003 I finally came to the end of myself and my attempts to fix it in my own power and my my fruitless attempts to just do something about my condition on my own and I I turned to Jesus for the first time in a long time and I sincerely meant it I begged him to remove my obsession to drink and he did that very day he did I I was freed of it and you know that sounds kind of strange to people because we're told in this world that we need we need treatment. I'm not saying you don't need treatment. You may need treatment as a stabilization to get you out of whatever environment you're in or whatever patterns you're in. Treatment can be a very helpful way to 
remove you from all of that. But I mean, when the treatment's done, you need to have support. You need to have a connection with your creator if you're going to make it. Anyway, that's I'm speaking for myself, but I believe that's the case for most people. I mean, you can be dry and be sober, but you don't have the spiritual rebirth that you need to live a life of recovery. So when I asked God to remove my obsession to drink, he did, he did that very day. And even though I've had, you know, struggles and I've been sober 15 years now and I, you know, I have times in life that are hard, but I've never felt uncontrollable craving or just this, oh, I'm on the verge to go to the liquor store. I can't take it anymore because it's gone. I have freedom from it. And that's what I'm interested in is really helping people get free. And that's what we want to do we want to do with this network is to connect people to, to mentors and to stories of hope of people who have done it, people who have overcome. It's not hopeless. It's never hopeless if you're alive and you're breathing and you're, you've got breath in your lungs and you're walking the earth today. It doesn't matter how old you are or how far you've gone or what you've done. Jesus is there to take you into his arms. All you have to do is be willing and surrender. And when people ask me, you know, they'll say, wow, you tried for four years to stop because that's, that's basically what I say because I was sober for a year and a half and then I had another, you know, year and a half of two years of relapsing and trying to get back into recovery. And the keys were acceptance and surrender and asking the Lord back into my life and inviting him into my problem. Those were the solutions, really. I had to stop thinking that I could do it on my own, that I could find a way in my own power. I had to get to the end of it. I had to accept that I cannot drink and have a functional life. I just cannot have both. And I just got to the point where I was so disgusted I didn't want it anymore. I wanted to be free and, you know, who the sun sets free is free indeed. And I was free. And for me, you know, that's what recovery is all about, is helping other people get free, helping people have an abundant life, having helping people just be fruitful. And um, that means for me, consistently seeking the Lord and involving Him in everything I do, asking Him, you know, hey, hey, Lord, what are we doing today? Who can I bless? Who can I help? Who are you going to put in my path today? And when you start using letting the, the lord use you that way your life just be it takes on a whole new dimension where you do have purpose you have meaning you know there's a reason you're here it's such a hopeless hopeless existence when you are in the bondage and the grips of your addiction because you you feel so worthless and um you have that spirit of of inferiority insecurity worthlessness depression anxiety all those things overpowering you so now I have to put God first. I want to. I seek him early and often. And, you know, I'm just, as David said in the Bible, I'm constantly meditating on his word. And I'm trying to keep his word in my mouth and in my heart all day long. And trying to just be aware of who in my environment might need me. So God can use us when we get free from our addiction, our bondage, our demons, when we're able to be free from that, we can really become a powerful, powerful tool in the kingdom. So that's what, what I'm doing these days, reading the Bible, praying, seeking God, trying to help others, and just doing my best to be an ambassador for Christ everywhere I go. Um, so I just wanted to, as I close out here, share this scripture from the Apostle Paul, and it's from First Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. All this is from God who reconciled himself to us through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed us to this message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. So with that, you know, I just want to make an appeal to you that if you are struggling, that you will reach out for help, that you would connect with someone who has done it and and that's one of the most powerful things you can do is connect with people just like you who have come through their addiction and they are now on the other side and they can bring hope and inspiration to you and i just really encourage you to take that next step today and i'm going to be praying for you god bless you